God bless you. We bring you greetings in the most holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We thank the Lord for everyone that's able to see us uh, this day. Amen. Uh, and to join in with us fellowship. Praise God. We thank God for all our supporters. Amen. All our subscribers. Amen. We thank God for all of those that are tuning in this hour. Let's go right into the word of God. Psalms chapter 15, verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Now, these words, tabernacle and holy hill, is a description of heaven. And the psalmist, praise God, is looking at the first revelation of heaven that was given by Moses. When Moses built the tabernacle, it was really... We can say his tabernacle was an earthly tabernacle he built, amen, because it's here on earth. But it represented heaven itself. So what God allowed Moses to do is to build, amen, a tabernacle to represent heaven. To represent heaven. To give us a revelation of heaven. So that they could somewhat have what we call, what we could call heaven on earth. Praise God, heaven on earth. So... All that God gave Moses was a revelation of heaven itself. Amen. Heaven itself. Praise God. Now let's keep, keep moving. Psalms chapter 24, verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Now watch this. Another description of heaven. Now if you go, if you look at... Uh, 15 and now 24, it's, it's by the same writer. It's, it's, it's David. David is sharing with us, amen, by way of his writing, revelations of heaven. The hill of the Lord. In, the, in 15, he called it the tabernacle. Praise God. But here he's calling it the hill of the Lord. Another description of heaven. Praise God. Now, the questions we need to look at is that David is basically asking God, who's going to heaven? Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Praise God. David is basically saying, you know, this is a question. Who? 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 Because in the Old Testament, there was no clear-cut revelation of what would happen to them after death. And there was no real promise given to them of eternal life. So David is asking the question, who's going to go to heaven, is basically what he's saying. Who shall ascend? Who shall ascend? Who's going up? Who's going up to heaven? Who shall ascend, amen, to thy holy hill? Who's going to heaven, is basically what he's saying. He doesn't know. Because in the writings of Moses, there's no indication. Remember now, David is doing is living during a time that all they really have, praise God, is, amen, the Pentateuch, the, the, the writings of Moses, the five books of Moses, and what may was written down by some of the prophets, which were still, amen, standing on what Moses had established as a foundation for the Old Testament saints. That was their word. That was the word of God for them. And David asked the question. Who shall ascend into thy holy hill? And if you go back to 15, he talks about the one that speaketh the truth in his heart, the one that's working righteousness. But uh, when we look at righteousness, righteousness as revealed in the 15th chapter of Genesis, that it came by faith. In the, in the 15th chapter of Genesis, it tells us that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him. As righteousness. So righteousness wasn't just, amen, just uh, uh, do's and don'ts, but it, it meant that you would have to believe the word of God. Uh, Israel, when they was taken out of uh, Egypt, didn't understand that God required faith of them. And their faith would have been their righteousness. But when they failed to believe God, they died in the wilderness. They died in the wilderness. Because when God required faith, they produced unbelief and doubt. And because of that, God allowed them to spend 
40 years in the wilderness, and they all died in the wilderness. They died. Only, praise God, their children, praise God, they would be partakers of the uh, land of Canaan, and also Joshua and Caleb, the two that came out, of, out praise God, uh, that was a part of the generation that perished in the wilderness, but they was two believers. Joshua believed the word of God, and Caleb believed the word of God. And because of that, they was able to enter into the land of Canaan. So faith determines righteousness. Now, in our day and time, we believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that is accounted unto us for righteousness. Praise God. Once you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you attain the righteousness of God. You have right standing with God. Praise God. You, you're then, amen, made right in the sight of God because you believe his word. Now, you have to hear his word in order to believe his word. Praise God. The Bible said, how can they believe on him? Or how can they call upon him of whom they have not believed? And how can they believe on him of whom they have not heard? Praise God. And how can they hear except there be a preacher? And how can they preach except they've been sent? Praise God. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But if you're not hearing the word of God, then we know you don't have no faith. And there's some people praying, praise God, that uh, they're getting in line and say, pray for my faith. And you, we really need to pray for your hearing. Because it's not your faith that's like, it's not a matter of praying for your faith. Because if you hear the word of God, amen, faith will come to you. But some of you, your hearing is bad. When you should be giving your attention to the word of God, you ignore the word of God. You cancel out the word of God. So then, therefore, there is no faith given to you. There's times people are sitting in church and their mind is somewhere else. Their body is there, but their mind is somewhere else. And they can't hear, praise God. But blessed is he that can hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Some can't hear. Everybody can't hear the word of God. There's some, they're going to counsel it out. Because it's not of interest to them. It's not something they're after. So then they're not going to hear. And then if they don't hear, there'll be no faith. And if there be no faith, then basically they're going to end up in the hands of the devil. Because they have no faith in God. But let's go on. Yes. Hebrew, Psalms 24, verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? Now the message of today is the holy place. The holy place. Another description of heaven. Heaven is holy. It is a holy place. Who's going to stand? Who's going to ascend? These are parallel statements, ascending and standing at this point. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Who's going to praise God end up in heaven? Who's going to heaven? We need to know, praise God. The psalmist is saying. We don't have no revelation, really. This is I'm speaking on the standpoint of an Old Testament uh, believer. They, they have, praise God, everything but the promise of. And to show you that, when Jesus came on the scene, there was a rich man that uh, came to Jesus, bowing down, kneeling before him, and saying, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, why ask such a question? You got the same question as David, the psalmist. You don't know, praise God, what's going to happen in the hereafter. Because he was an Old Testament believer. And when Jesus came on the scene, Old Testament was still in force. The New Testament didn't start until after his, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. When the outpouring of the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, then the New Testament church, amen, began. 
So this man is back, and he, he, he's talking to Jesus. He's the Old Testament uh, believer, and he doesn't know. He's asking Jesus to explain something to him that the law never did. There was nothing written in the writings of Moses that could guarantee this man eternal life. So now he, praise God, meets the Messiah. Amen. The, 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 uh, uh, the answer, praise God, to all humanity, which is the Lord Jesus. And he wanted to know, what must I do? Well, the Bible said that Jesus has been given power over all flesh to give eternal life to whom he will. And Jesus told him how to do that, to pick up your cross and follow me. Yes, he told him to sell what he had because he couldn't have two gods in his life. He couldn't have money as his God and then serve the true and living God. Something had to depart. So he was telling him because he knew what his problem was. Praise God. He uh, had money, and it wasn't a problem that he had money, but his money had him. Praise God. And it was controlling him. So Jesus was telling him, praise God, basically to give it up. Sell all that you have and give to the poor and pick up your cross and follow me. Well, what if he sold all that he had? And still didn't follow Jesus. He would never experience eternal life. The, the greatest thing Jesus asked this man to do was to follow him. Because Jesus is the author of eternal life. He's the only one that can give eternal life to us. And so now the giver of eternal life is on the scene. And he can answer the question that was given in the Old Testament. Who shall ascend? Well, those that yield their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, they shall stand in the holy place. They shall ascend into the hill of the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So the question that was being answered by the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the holy place. Who's going to stand there? Who's going to go there? Who's going to heaven? But those that, that put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who's gone? Who's gone? It is those that trust their lives in the hands of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, my sheep, now watch, watch the words of Christ. My sheep follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. Praise God. Praise God. Let's keep reading. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1. Yes. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinance of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Now watch this. Uh, the first covenant is referring now to the old covenant. It's the old covenant now to us. Because there's another covenant, which is now the new covenant, which is that which represents the gospel of Jesus Christ. The old covenant, amen, uh, was all about the laws written by Moses. Praise God. And within the writings of Moses was a foretell of the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God was, praise God, uh, using Moses to stage the coming of Christ by his writings. By his writings. All the laws and the prophets were speaking about Jesus. Everything was about Jesus, the coming of Christ. And now the fulfillment is here. Jesus is on the scene, praise God. He's on the scene. And he goes to the cross, give his life, pays, amen, the, the, the debt of sin. Praise God. Then raise again from the dead. Resurrected from the dead and then ascends back to heaven and then sends the spirit, the promise of the father upon all the believers on the day of Pentecost. And then the church begins. Now, Paul is writing of the old covenant. He's, he's talking to a group of people, Jewish people, that understands the first covenant. And so he's going to use that first covenant to establish the new. That's what we do with the, uh, the written uh, law of Moses now. We take the old covenant 
and we use it to establish the new covenant. Because the new covenant takes precedence over the old. So we, we would tick, amen, the old and reveal the new, praise God. We would tick the old and preach Christ to those that listen. So the gospel is contained even in the Old Testament, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul is using, actually, uh, writings of Moses to explain things about Jesus. But it's a worldly sanctuary because the, the tabernacle, praise God, is being built on earth by Moses at the time to represent what is going on in heaven. Yes, keep reading. For there was a tabernacle made for the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the shoe bread, which is called the sanctuary. Now, here he, he's saying the first tabernacle because it's like two tabernacles in one, uh, which represented an inner and an outer. The first represented an outer. And we could later on, when the temple was made, we begin to call it the outer court. And the second represented the inner court. On the first tabernacle or the outer court went all of the priests to do their daily administrations. But the inner court, only one priest was allowed in there. And that was the high priest. Only one. Keep reading. Them. We'll see this. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Now, see, now the holiest of all is now referring to that inner court. The holiest of all. Because there's an outer and there's an inner court. When Gabriel appeared, praise God, to Mary, to Zacharias, he said, I am he. That standeth in the presence of God. In other words, I'm in the inner court. Praise. I'm in the holiest. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm not just, look, I'm not just any angel God sent to you. But praise God, I stand in the presence of God. I'm right before his throne. Now there's an outer court, praise God, where the other angels may have to gather. But they haven't given the privilege of coming into the inner court. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's where I stand. You can't get no closer than this was Gabriel saying, <laughs> praise God. My God, my God. Gabriel was boasting in this. I am he, praise God. Everybody can get this privilege, praise God. But I am he that standeth in the presence of God. Because all of the angels couldn't stand in God's presence. But Gabriel said, I do, praise God. So God didn't send this any angel to you. But he sent one to have really high ranking. One that has, amen, a more closeness with God. So I am he that standeth in the presence of God. When he appeared unto Zechariah to tell him about the birth of John the Baptist. And when he appeared unto Mary to tell Mary about the birth of the Messiah that would come forth, which was Jesus. He was sent. Now this is a special angel, praise God, because he's in the inner court, praise God. God had, amen, his heaven set up where he had an inner and an outer court. Now, you're on the outer court. You're not but so close, but you're still in the number, praise God. <laughs> praise God amongst the angels. Praise God. At least you're in heaven, but you're not, praise God, at the throne where the inner court is. See, the second, the second represents the inner. And so in heaven, God's given us a revelation. There's an inner court and an outer court. There's a first tabernacle and there's a second tabernacle, which is basically describing a inner court and an outer court. And all the angels are not on the same level with God. They're all not on the same level. So Gabriel comes to prove that. And God also sent Gabriel to Daniel. Praise God. He told Daniel, you know, your prayer was heard from the time you opened your mouth. You've been fasting for 21 days. You afflicted yourself. Praise God. You had to convince yourself that God heard you. <laughs> but God heard you before you even got on that fast, brother. 
God heard you from the beginning of the time you decided to go on a fast. God had already heard you. Remember now, God knows our thoughts from afar off. So even before you even get your words together to formulate a prayer to God, he had already heard your prayer. Because he knows your thoughts from afar. See, God, he looks upon the heart. And see, when God already see what, the, what you're about to say out of your mouth, because he already knows your heart, praise God. He knows your thoughts from afar off. Before you even formulate a prayer, God has heard every prayer before it's been, even been prayed. That's what we say. You took the time to pray, but God heard it before you even got it out. And already decided what he's going to do about it. Praise God. And some will be fasting for weeks and months on end, thinking you're trying to get a hold of God. You don't have to get a hold of God. God's already there. He's already on the scene. Praise God. You don't have to make a whole lot of noise to get his attention. You already got his attention because the eyes of the Lord goes to and fro throughout the earth, beholding the good and the evil. God don't miss nothing. You don't got to, you know, somebody said, God's trying to tell you something. God would never try to tell you nothing. Praise God. He just go ahead and tell you. <laughs> somebody, you know, you heard people say some strange things. Their car flipped over. God must be trying to tell you something. Really? <laughs> God's having a hard time trying to get a message over to you, isn't he? Oh, no. You in a car wreck. God ain't trying to tell you nothing. That's the devil coming to kill, steal, and destroy. That's what's going on. Praise God. God ain't trying to tell you nothing. Praise God. Because God don't try. He just will tell you. And you don't have to have tragedy and misfortune for you to know that God is speaking to you. You don't have to have that. But if you have it, just know the scripture that, that, that is revealed in the Bible that tells us the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came that you may have life. And that more, but I'm not going to kill you. <laughs> I'm going to try to save you, praise God. I came that you may have life and that more abundantly. But all the mishaps in your life, that's the devil coming to steal, kill, and destroy. Because you're outside of my umbrella of protection. You're not in my will. You're not in my purpose. So you're already in the hands of the wicked one. That's why he's wrecking your life. He's wrecking your plane because you have not, praise God, submitted your life unto the Lord Jesus Christ. So the devil is having a heyday on you and you think God is messing with you. Things go wrong. You say the Lord is after you. God ain't after you. The devil is trying to destroy you before you get to God. That's what he's trying to do. That's all that's going on. God, God is not even doing anything to cause havoc in your life. But if come, your life is in turmoil, it's because God is missing, meaning that you haven't invited him in. You haven't allowed him to come in. So, of course, things are going to go wrong. Anything can happen to you at any time. You get to see people walk outside, and all of a sudden you hear about somebody getting gunned down. Did that person know the Lord? Have they submitted their life to Jesus? Where they was already in the devil's hands. So the devil wrecked their plane. Because you chose not to serve Jesus. So the devil owns you. He owns you because of your decision. But if you follow Jesus, you can break that ownership the devil has over your life. And move out to chaos and confusion. And establish the peace of Christ in your life. Because when Jesus comes, he's the end. Of all chaos and all confusion. He's the end of that. Praise God. That's what peace really means. It's the end of all of those things. Praise God. Let's keep reading. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 7. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year. Not without blood. Now which watch this. Underline the word. The high priest went into the inner court alone. God is speaking to us now. All the other priests could go in to that first tabernacle or that outer court. They all could go there. But when it came to the inner court, only the high priest could enter. And he went in there alone. 
and the people standing without. Start over again on that. Yes. That verse, go ahead. But into the second went the high priest alone once every once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. Yeah, so now in, in this this earthly tabernacle that's on earth that's supposed to represent God, God is also showing that the high priest is not worthy because he got off up. Amen. Uh, sacrifice not only for the people but for himself. So then, when we look at it, he is not quite out of let's say the range of of error himself. So he had failed God as well as what we're saying. He had failed God as well. The high priest, the earthly high priest, did. He had failed God as well. So he goes in alone. But when Jesus comes on the scene, he is the one that's without sin. This high priest, praise God, don't have to offer up a sacrifice for himself. And he don't have to come with the blood of bulls and goats, but it come with his own blood. Because his blood is holy. Because he is holy. And this is the high priest. The high priest. Christ. But keep reading. Let's go to the next. Let's go to that following verse after that, after what you just read. Give me the next verse after that. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. Now watch this. In the fact that the high priest went in alone, the Holy Spirit of God is telling us that the way into the holiest was not made manifest. And what I was saying is that that the way to heaven was not quite revealed at that time. In what we see, the way they conducted, amen, this day of atonement is what is really going on. Where the high priest goes there every year, the day of atonement was once a year. And the high priest goes in there once a year, goes in there alone. And the people standing without. In this, the Holy Spirit is revealing to us that the way into heaven, the holiest, had not been made known or manifest to the Old Testament saints. That's why the rich man came to Jesus and said, look, what must I do? Because it, we are under a covenant where we don't know what the end's going to be. We don't know how to get to heaven. We don't know how to access, uh, to a a access it. We don't know how to access it, rather. We don't know how to gain access. We don't know. We don't know how to get to the holy place or to stand in the holy place. So it was not yet manifest to the Old Testament. But then it was manifest to those in the New Testament. Praise God. But those, praise God, that died before Jesus came, had no revelation of how to access heaven. And even when Jesus was on the scene, they didn't know how to access. He himself would reveal that he was what? The way, the truth, and the life. Meaning, I am the way to heaven. I'm, the, I'm giving you the manifestation. I'm going to manifest, amen, which, which is unknown to you. The way to access heaven is through me. Through me. Through Christ, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's still the same, really. You can't get to heaven without Jesus still. But Jesus made it known. The only way to get there, you have to understand that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Everything must come through me. In order to access, in order to get to the holy place. It's going to have to come through me. There's no other way, way to get in. Let's read uh, the uh, 10th chapter of Hebrews. Yes. Which stood only in the meats and the drinks, in the divers, washing, car carnal or ordinance imposed on them until the time of reformation. What, what, what verse are we reading in, in 10? Um, verse 10. No, no. 
Seven. I think it's seven. Hold up. No, that's not the verse we want. We want the verse that tells you uh, having boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he have concentrate, concentrated for us, that is, uh, through the veil, which is his flesh. You see that? That's going to be uh, our turn to help you out with that. I may have gave you the wrong verse. We, we want to go, amen, to where, he, where uh, the 10th chapter talks about having boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus in the 10th chapter of Hebrews. So when we look at this, amen, you'll see that uh, this, this would be uh, uh, 19. Oh, 10 and 19. 10 and 19, yes. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the wholeness by the blood of Jesus. We stop right there because it's telling you how to get to heaven. It's telling you how to get to heaven. The, the New Testament, praise God, give us the revelation that was missing in the Old Testament. How do you stand in that holy place? How do you get to heaven? It's through the blood of Jesus. It's through the blood of Jesus. And all the Old Testament needed was for Jesus to hang on the cross. All those that died in faith, waiting for the Messiah to come. All they needed for Christ to do was to hang on that cross. And then after hanging on the cross, resurrect from the dead, praise God, then ascend back and to enter, praise God, into the holy, the holiest of all with his own blood that they may attain access to heaven by the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus. So not only just, praise God, one, the, the, the new covenant saints benefit from the blood of Jesus, but also those under the old covenant as well benefit from the blood of Jesus. Because through the blood of Jesus, access is attained access is attained. So we see this in 19. Having therefore boldness. Yes, read that again. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holy, holiest yes. by the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Keep reading. By a new living, by, by new and living way. Now watch this. By a new and living way because this is where the New Testament is now being established. It's established by the blood of Jesus. It is now a new and a living way, praise God. Because it's new because it was not, praise God, revealed in the old. And, then, and as it's said in the ninth chapter of, of Hebrews, that the Holy Spirit was revealing that the way into heaven had not been manifest. But now it is manifest. For the Old Testament, saints, David was saying, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord because it was not yet manifest? That's why he had that question. Who shall stand in the holy place because it was not yet manifest? Praise God. Hallelujah. They didn't know where they was going, really. Hallelujah. They didn't know that. They didn't know, praise God. They didn't know how to access heaven. The greatest thing that Israel was, get, was given to them was the promise of Canaan. God promised them the promised land, which was the land of Canaan. He didn't promise them eternal life. He didn't promise them heaven. He never promised them anything like that. They had an earthly promise. That they would attain the land of Canaan. That was the promise that they rest on. Praise God. But God never told them. He never spoke through the mouth of Moses and said that you guys would have access to heaven at all. So all that Moses was doing was revealing that Christ was needed to come in order for them to attain. Praise God. And access to heaven. And then we'll get into later on how 
Jesus led captivity captive because everyone that died under the old covenant went into captivity. And Jesus will have to lead them, amen, after the sprinkling of his blood. He would have to, praise God, then lead them out of captivity into heaven itself. Praise God. Into heaven itself. Praise God. So everyone that died would go under captivity. Let's go to Psalms uh, 14. I believe it's 14 and 6, if I'm not mistaken. Let's turn to Psalms 14 and 6. Ye have shamed the counsel of the poor because the Lord is his drop, refuge. Drop down to the uh, last verse of that chapter. Oh, that the salvation of Israel will come out of Zion when the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people. Watch this. Now watch this. David, ja David is prophesying. Hold up. David is prophesying. David sees that. A captivity, but it's not the captivity of Babylon. It's not the captivity, praise God, of any nation over them. Because at the time that David wrote this, that Israel was not in captivity. So what captivity are you talking about, David? The captivity that every one of them would face at death. This is what David is talking about. That he would turn away that captivity. So let's read, let's read that verse again. Go ahead. Oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion. Now, who is the salvation of Israel? Messiah Jesus. And then another place in, in the book of Romans uh, quotes a place in the Old Testament that says that uh, a deliverer shall come out of Zion. A deliverer will come out of Zion. Oh, that the salvation come out of Zion, which is Jesus. Jesus is that salvation. He is that one, Messiah Jesus. Go ahead. Oh, that the salvation of Israel where come out of Zion when the Lord bringeth back the captivity of when his people. the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people because all the Old Testament saints would enter into captivity, but he's going to bring back the captivity, meaning he's going to bring them out of captivity. And what's going to happen when they come out of captivity? Keep reading. Jacob shall rejoice. Oh, they're going to rejoice because we've been waiting. We've been waiting, praise God, for the Messiah to come. And then Paul reveals this in the fourth chapter of Ephesians when he said he had to descend before he ascended. So he descended, praise God, into the lower parts of the earth. That's where he would lead them out of captivity. And then it goes on to say in the fourth chapter of Ephesians, he led captivity captive, praise God. He brought them out. And when he brings them out of captivity, Jacob will be glad and Israel will rejoice, praise God. Hallelujah. It's going a little deep into the gospel. But David wanted to know who shall ascend because there was, it was not yet manifest to them. That's why we got these questions. Who's going to abide in thy tabernacle, who's going to dwell in thy holy hill, 14, not 14, but 15th uh, division of song, where David says that. Questions about who's going to heaven, praise God. <laughs> who's going, Father? How are we going to get there? You have not yet manifest to us the way there. But the way is on its way, and that's Jesus. Jesus is the way. The way is on his way. <laughs> And when the way shows up, praise God, he's going to make a way by bringing you out of captivity, praise God, and leading captivity captive, praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. In that time, Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. And if we stay with the 24th division of song, you keep reading, David keep giving us more and more revelation. David talks about, praise God, who shall... Uh, ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place. But as you go down further, David says, amen, lift up your heads, all your gates, because you're ready to come out of captivity now. And be ye lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. He's coming after you, praise God. He's coming to bring you out of captivity. And who is this king? Oh, we're looking for him, Messiah Jesus. He's the Lord strong and mighty. He's the Lord mighty to save. Who is this king of glory? Praise God. Messiah Jesus. 
that he will come on the scene. Hallelujah. To bring his people out of captivity. Because there was a captivity given to everyone that died under the old covenant. They died, praise God, looking for the Messiah. So they would die with faith that the Messiah would come. And so did he come to deliver the Old Testament saints out of captivity. Hallelujah. And transport them from one location to another, which would be heaven. Hallelujah. So who shall stand? Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who's going to heaven? And who shall stand in the holy place? And still again, all these descriptions of heaven. But it's going to come through the blood of Jesus. It's coming through the blood of Jesus. We will stand in the holy place. Let's end in the book of Revelations. Seventh chapter. Revelation. Revelations chapter 7, verse 9. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude. Now, if we look at why he says after this, it's because now we are fulfilling in this seventh chapter what was prophesied in the book of Ezekiel, in the book of Jeremiah, even by the mouth of Isaiah, they spoke of a remnant of Israel. And, and Isaiah said it this way, except the Lord uh, uh, gave us a seed, we have been as Solomon and as Gomorrah, talking about Israel as a nation. Those that once w could not be numbered for multitude, that you couldn't count them, praise God, it was like trying to count the stars. A nation, praise God, that, praise God, was compared to the, the grains of the sands of the sea in multitude. Now it's a fraction of people that God's going to selectively pick in the end time. So that no more will we say is the sands of the sea at this point or is the stars. Because they if you can number them, and they were being numbered in this seventh chapter, you go through every tribe. Tribes are mentioned here. And that's why the writer said after this, after God selectively, after he picked that remnant of Israel, the 144,000, that's a remnant of Israel. That's a remnant of Israel. As was prophesied by the prophets that a remnant shall be saved. That's a small number. Do you know when you look at a remnant, it's like the word remnant comes from what we use when we look at carpet. If you laid carpet and the remnant is the leftovers, that's a small portion of the carpet. The majority of the carpet has been laid, but what's left over is, is, is the remnant. That's what you usually throw away. But God's going to tick that which was normally thrown away, which would be considered the outcast of Israel. And he's going to gather them. As he said in, in another place, he shall gather the outcasts of Israel. A remnant also represents those who have been thrown away. Whom the world has forgotten about, but God's going to choose them. Hallelujah. Because when the world forgets you, God's going to choose you. Praise God. When the world turns their back on you, God's looking at you. Praise God. His eyes are resting on you. So you can put your hope in him because you have no hope nowhere else. These 40, 144,000 is going to be that. They're going to be the, that remnant, that throwaway that God's going to collect. But the main part, the carpet, that's going to be that. When you look at a carpet, when you throw away, usually you throw away but maybe 5 or 10% of that carpet, 90% uh, goes on the floor. But God said the 90% is not going to make it. And then one in the days of Christ came to Jesus in the book of Luke, I believe the 13th chapter, and said, uh, Lord, shall there be few to be saved? Because he heard about the remnant, praise God. He heard about it all his life, as, as, a, as an Israelite, that only a few of us going to be saved because so many hard-headed folk, so many are going to reject the, the message of the Messiah. More of Israel is going to reject and receive. The small number that receive becomes the remnant, praise God. And this remnant was numbered, and we got 144,000. After this, now they're in the earth, 
They're in the earth. But then after this, we talk about a group that's no longer in the earth. But they are in the earth, the 144,000. But when we read, but after this, I saw a number that could not be numbered. Now, that's the church. That's the church. But the ones that could be numbered, that was numbered in the 144,000, that's Israel. But then I saw a number. Now, when he was counting the number, the 144,000, he was counting those on the earth. But the ones he's counting now that can't be numbered, he's not talking about in the earth. We're going to see that. Start from the beginning. I'm not going to interrupt you now. Go ahead. I just want us to kind of get a little of what's going on here as we go into this verse. I don't want you to miss that. That we first talked about the remnant of Israel, the 144,000. Which is a sad day for the nation of Israel. Only a fraction of them shall be saved. That's sad. I'm talking about the end time. In the end time, praise God, when the church had been taken out of the earth and Israel be representing again God in the earth. It's going to be a small fraction of them, though. The majority of them is going to fall under the power of Antichrist. And Jesus spoke of it. Jesus told the Pharisees this. He said, listen, I came in my father's name and you received me not. But another is coming in his own name and him. You will receive. He's talking about the Antichrist. Somebody else coming. The devil going to send his man. And he's coming in his own name. And this one, this false prophet, this false Messiah, you're going to receive him. But you won't be able to receive, receive the true one, which is Jesus himself. Jesus said he's coming. Y'all man is coming. With all the tricks, all the lying wonders, he's coming. He's coming. You couldn't receive the truth, but you're definitely going to believe a lie. God's going to send you a strong delusion so you might believe that lie. Because if you don't believe the gospel, you're preparing yourself for a lie. You already got a strong delusion upon you if you reject this message of the gospel. A strong delusion has already been sent to you. That, that you might believe a lie. Because if you don't believe the gospel, you're going to believe a lie. Because it's the way he said that. Go ahead and read to it. Start from the beginning. Yes. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, the, of the all nations. The multitude is the church, because the church represents how many nations? All nations. I see a number that can't be numbered. A multitude from all nations. Keep reading. Could not... Of all nations, kindreds of people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes. Now watch this. The church is standing at the throne of God. They're standing in the holy place. That's why I went here. The church is standing in the holy place at the time that Israel is being numbered. We're in the holy place. Praise God. Hallelujah. From every nation. Kindred means every family. From every family. We're standing before God. Praise the name of God. And we cannot be numbered. The church cannot be numbered. It cannot be numbered. Praise God. You're seeing a prophecy of yourself. You just following the Lord Jesus Christ. You just in the body of Christ. God is telling you. A prophecy of yourself. You're going to be standing right there at the throne of God. Hallelujah. Rejoicing in the Lamb. And at the time that the church is taken out of the earth, the remnant is going to be revealed. The remnant of Israel. The 144,000. That's a remnant. That's a, that's a small remnant. The rest of them have gone astray. That means the majority of them is following the spirit of Antichrist. But it's a selective few that's recognizing him as Messiah that's going to be persecuted by the Antichrist. And Daniel talked about how he's going to uh, persecute the holy people. They'll be that holy people. They'll be persecuted. But they're going to refuse to take the mark of the beast. And the 
an image of his name. They're going to refuse that. They're going to refuse that. Praise the name of God. Praise the name of God. So we see a number. That's the church. They're standing before God. They're standing in the holy place, right before the throne of God. From every nation. That's the church. Every nation. And from every family, every kindred. That's the fulfillment that God gave to, uh, uh, fulfillment of the prophecy gave to Abraham. He told Abraham that from your seed that shall all the families, the kindred, families, kindred of the earth be blessed. To give your life to Jesus is to be blessed. To serve the Lord Jesus Christ is to be blessed. Hallelujah. In your seed, in Christ, Abraham, in your seed, because Abraham, because Christ was the seed of Abraham, in your seed, Abraham, in Christ, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Because God's going to make sure from every family there will be someone that's serving Jesus. And from every nation there will be someone that's serving Jesus. That's a promise. That's why when I used to witness and go into people's homes, I said, there's one person, there's somebody in this family that's going to say yes to Jesus. I, get, I may not get the whole family. Praise God. But somebody got to represent this family in serving Jesus. And from every nationality, somebody in, within that nationality got to represent following Jesus. That one that followed Jesus becomes the representation of that nation. Of that family. Praise the name of God. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is unto you and unto your children and unto them that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. God bless you.